to see everyone and have you here with us again. It's good to be together as God's people and to experience His blessing and to pray to Him and to read from His Word and to meet with each other and to encourage each other. Now, uh, we've been learning about the birth of the church uh, from the book of Acts and we're going to continue that series. We looked at Acts 2, um, how the church was started by the Holy Spirit um, and in response, in response to Jesus being uh, the Messiah, the Christ, and ascended to God's right hand and how He poured out the Holy Spirit. We looked at Acts 4, where the church ran into opposition, um, even from among its own people, but they didn't shrink back and they called on God for boldness, to take His word forward with boldness. And today we'll be looking at Acts 11, a pivotal story in Acts, um, which is actually a pivotal story in the whole of the Bible and therefore is a pivotal time in the history of the world. So it's, a, it's quite an important chapter in the Bible. Uh, but the book of Acts is an important book. Um, and so, and, and the reason for that, the pivotal nature of it, is that um, God is bringing to, to fruition a promise that He's always carried through the Old Testament, and that is that His people, are, His promises, are not just for the Jewish people, but for all the nations of the world, which we represent, which proves that we, this is why we exist, because of the things that happen in the book of Acts, and specifically Acts sort of 9, 10, and 11 onwards. God has always promised that He's going to have a multinational people of God. And this is how the Psalms speak about the reality, the promise that God is always going to do that. So sometimes, well, often we start our services with um, some Psalms. I'm just going to read two Psalms that capture some of that feeling for us. Psalm 66 says this, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises to your name. We're going to use that psalm as a song just now. And in Psalm 67, the next psalm goes on to say this. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us, so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. And the land yields its hearts. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Well, fantastic news is that we can start singing again. And so I'm sure you've enjoyed meeting together and sort of responding and reciting the songs and the songs and the canticles we've got in our church, but nothing replaces quite like singing. And so we're going to sing together for the first time since February or March. Really, it's incredible. Um, and so uh, you'll have to keep your master on, I'm afraid. But uh, let's sing and give glory to God and, uh, and stand and sing together. And so we'll sing, give thanks to the Lord, our God and King, uh, forever God is faithful. And then everyone needs compassion, mighty God is mighty to say so.
commemorate uh, the Reformation, the time when the church reconnected with the gospel 500 years ago, right now, when Martin Luther posted the 95 Thesis on the door of the church in Wittenberg on uh, the 31st of October, 1517. And so churches in our tradition, Protestant Reformed churches, uh, just have a reminder on the Sunday closest to the 31st of October. You'll probably know it as coming up close to Halloween, you'll see the stuff in the, in the windows and people get dressed up. Um, and it's actually, funny enough, Halloween is a, a Christian holiday, or it used to be Christian, it's probably not that much anymore. Sure. Um, uh, Halloween is All Hallows' Eve, um, and the 1st of November is known as All Saints' Day. Um, we don't really celebrate that anymore because we don't pray to the saints that are, are dead, we pray to the living God. Um, but nevertheless, that's when Luther chose to say something about the church and said, look guys, there's a problem here, we need to fix it. And it's interesting because we've been learning about the church and that the church was born by Christ and the Spirit. And um, Luther said very similar things to what we've been saying. He, in many respects, we remind ourselves of the things that were kind of rediscovered all those years ago. Luther himself would have said, well, he's just rediscovering what the early church was writing about. Um, and uh, he wrote a catechism, um, which is really just to help, it wasn't to help adults, it was to help children, actually. And he uh, went through the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the, uh, the, the Creed, the Apostles' Creed that we say. And the section on, uh, he believes in the Holy Spirit, we believe in the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Catholic Church, which means the whole, the universal church. And then Luther um, made these comments. He says this, um, uh, the combination of Jesus and the Spirit as the place where the church is born and gives birth, the church is often expressed by Luther um, in this way. He says this in his larger catechism. He says, I believe that there is upon earth a little holy group and congregation of pure saints, talking about the church, under one head, even Christ, called together by the Holy Ghost in one faith, one mind, and one understanding, with manifold gifts, gifts yet agreeing in love, without sects or schisms. And what Luther says, working alongside Christ is the Holy Spirit in order to bring salvation. And the Holy Spirit is vital, Luther says this, for neither you nor I could ever know anything of Christ or believe on him and obtain him for our Lord unless it was offered to us and granted to our hearts by the Holy Ghost through the preaching of the gospel. For Luther, you don't receive Christ all by yourself. You receive him through the gospel. And so in order to receive Christ properly, you need to have a proper message. And in order to have a true or proper message, you need to have proper or true preaching. So Luther goes on to say, where Christ is not preached, there is no Holy Ghost who creates, calls and gathers in the Christian church. What's interesting there is that for Luther, the Holy Spirit doesn't just call individual people to be individual Christians. He calls individual people to be part of a community, the church, uh, what he calls that little holy group. And so we have been, uh, what we have been reminded of recently by looking at Acts uh, about Jesus and the Spirit has been taught by Luther 500 years ago. Isn't it good to know that we belong to a tradition of biblical teaching and the message you hear from Nick and myself is corroborated and confirmed by some of the best teachers uh, that the church has had. And just, it doesn't make it true because Luther says it's true. It's true because he goes straight back to the Bible and says, okay, what does the Bible say about these things? And exactly what we do here. <clears throat> Nevertheless, let's turn to our own tradition now and make use of the gifts that the Spirit has given to our spiritual forefathers. And uh, we use our prayer book to pray together and to say, to confess our sins. And so we'll be doing that in a second. Uh, from the prayer book it says this, Dear friends, the scriptures urge us to acknowledge our wickedness before Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, and to confess our many sins to Him, that they may be forgiven through His infinite goodness and mercy in Jesus Christ our Lord. We should always humbly admit our sins before, our, uh, before God, but especially when we meet together, to give thanks for the great benefits we've received from Him, to praise Him and worship Him, to hear his holy word and to ask what's necessary for our bodies as well as our souls. Therefore, let us come before the throne of our gracious God and confess our sins together. Let's pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like 
lost sheep. We have left undone what we ought to have done, and we have done what we ought not to have done. We have followed our own ways and our own desires, and we have neglected and broken your holy laws. Have mercy on us, Lord. Restore those who repent and confess their sins. According to your promises, declare in Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant merciful Father, for his sake, that hereafter we may live a righteous and obedient life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Uh, let's confirm that God hears and answers our prayers from his word, so we may comfort each other with the knowledge that our sins are truly forgiven, and that God truly is our friend. Uh, hear these words from Ephesians chapter 2. Paul writing again to the church at Ephesus and says this, Because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now what a wonderful truth, <laughs> that though our sins are many, God's mercy in Christ is always more. We've got another song we can sing together. Uh, it's a new-ish song. We've sung it once or twice, probably in lockdown, but uh, it's a lovely song called His Mercy is More. So let's stand and uh, confirm our sins are forgiven by saying to you. Thank you. 
Kelly's got a notice uh, about uh, youth and kids. Hi. So as most of you should know, uh, youth has started up again. We've been going for a couple of weeks. We've had a nice food group to keep us going. Um, but this week is very exciting. We've got a movie night. So please bring any teenagers you know of, anyone from grade 5 all the way up to grade 10 is welcome to come and join us. Um, for a movie night this is Friday coming from 7 o'clock and we're going to extend it to a little bit later just so we can make sure we finish the movie until half past 9. 7 until half past 9, please get the word out for as many teenagers as you can. We're going to have lots of fun. I'm not going to tell you what the movie is just so we can keep the suspense a little bit. Um, but we're going to be in this hall for an awesome movie night. Please come along. Thank you. Too many notes. <laughs> And my colleague is up. Is it still up? It's still up. Uh, yeah. Sunday mornings are meant to be peaceful. They are. Um, I have to find my notes now, so just give me a second. Just cut that out of the video. Yeah, just cut that out of the video. That's fine. <laughs> Post production will fix it. There's only so much you can do though. Okay. On with the notices, thank you, Gabby. Right, so um, some notices about, um, uh, well, we've been learning about uh, some of the marks of the early church. We've noticed how, it's, uh, how generous they've been. So the Holy Spirit uh, calls people to be part of, his, of God's kingdom, and He changes their hearts and minds. And uh, we've seen that the marks of the church have been prayer and fellowship. Uh, and one of the marks is generosity. And so uh, we just want to let you know that. Um, you can still give your tithes and offerings to us. Um, just pop them in the back of the box. Not the back of the box. The box at the back of the church. It's actually in the, as you walk in. The box is as you walk in on your left. It's on your left. Um, and um, so we don't pass uh, the uh, tithing bags around anymore because of the coronavirus. But we do still need to um, take collections. So please, uh, if you're giving cash, you can use the box at the back of the church. Um, otherwise. EFTs are fine. If you need to set it up, then speak with Alan, our treasurer. And then at the same time, um, we are, you know, we're opening our church services again, and uh, we do need help. Well, not that we need help. Uh, it's it's our church. We are the church together, and so uh, there's many slots opening up for um, making sure that the services are running, and so many slots for service, uh, for serving each other, and for serving God. Um, so, uh, Nick and myself and various uh, admin staff, Sylvia and other team leaders, I guess, in the different uh, departments, we, we, we do need some help. And so, um, if you get a call or uh, a text or uh, asking for help, please just uh, be generous with your time. And so, this kind of stuff requires a lot of work. Um, and so, uh, if we, we, need, we need help to get it done. Um, so, join us and uh, you can serve the saints and you can serve God by by helping the church kind of work together as a, as a church on a Sunday, but also during the week and other things as well. And then um, we spoke about, uh, we, we, we asked you to come and uh, help us uh, with the uh, development next door, the Latimer House Working Party, and I want to give some feedback on that. But also just to chat a little bit uh, about Latimer House itself. Um, so we should have some slides for that, that's great. Um, just to, 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 to chat briefly um, about uh, uh, Latimer House. Um, uh, the reason for a place like Latimer House is that, um, well, first of all, just to know, it's, it's, it's a ministry that we've started that is partnering with St. Mark's Church. Um, it's separate to St. Mark's Church. It's not St. Mark's Church that is running Latimer House. It's an NGO that we've started. Um, uh, myself, Jean, and, and Greg are um, kind of heading it up. So if you need more information, uh, me, Jean, or Greg are the guys to speak to, uh, two guys and a lady. Um, but uh, the reason for a place like that in my house is that um, the God of the universe is the God of everything. He's the sovereign Lord of everything that has been created. And so all of life must be lived to the glory of God. Um, from uh, we, we speak to you for, as ministers. Um, to run your business as a Christian, to have a Christian family at home, and so it's important also to have a thing like Christian education. 
Uh, nothing in life is neutral. We have bought into this mentality in the West, but in fact, all education is based on prin Christian principles. The very notion, for example, of the university was developed within a conscious Christian framework. The universities evolved out of the Middle Ages when the Christian church was... Uh, everyone had that idea that Christianity is the only way to think about things. Now, schools, our high schools, used to be more or less Christian, but they're becoming less and less so. And recently, with the release of what's called the CSE curriculum, the Comprehensive Sexuality Education Curriculum, it kind of exploded the myth that schooling is neutral. The education department is pushing a very specific sexual agenda, and it's not at all based on the Bible. And so that Maha seeks to build a Bible-based life and worldview so that our children may grow up to be thoroughly equipped to live a Christian life, extend the kingdom of God in their chosen vocations, and engage with their culture and critique worldly philosophies and ideologies. Now, um, essentially, Latimas is designed to do discipleship training for teenagers so that they can fulfill their potential as disciples and grow up to be mature and productive members of Christ's church. So there's no viable Christian high school in the southern suburbs area, and there are a few international schools, but they've got sky-high fees. Um, and so we could have developed an actual uh, Christian high school, but that requires a lot of jumping through hoops with the education department. And so one option for many parents as they're looking around wanting what to do with their kids is to have them registered as uh, kind of home school or independent school learners and to do an um, online course via Cambridge called the Cambridge International Exam Certificates. Um, and that opens up both local and international universities. And uh, Cambridge itself is, is still it's a really good teaching method and requires critical and analytical skills. It's not just rote learning. And so we, at Latin House, we're using it as a facility. We're using the building next door as a facility to do online homeschooling for children who will access Cambridge International Exams. Um, so, we want to open up for the start of 2021 academic year, which is why we've been doing all the building and uh, painting and developing work uh, next door. Um, and just to give you a just brief update then, um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into getting it started and getting the building next door ready. It, was in quite a state, and that's why we've been running our work parties. That's helped tremendously. Thank you to everyone who might be working, uh, walking around a little bit stiff today. Great job yesterday. I'll show some photos of, of what we got up to. Um, what I'd like to do is invite you to go have a look. It's, it's looking better and better. So just pop over next door. It's right here. Just thump the gate open and, and walk through. And you'll see we've done, I think, pretty miraculous work on the garden so far. Um, the inside is busy being gutted. Um, where we stand in terms of getting the school up and running, um, we've got uh, four, potentially five applications signed up for next year. Uh, we need five and a half to uh, break even. Uh, that's just the money covers, but uh, six pupils will cover the, the, the cost of the school for the, for the beginning. And then it can take up to a maximum probably 20 at this point. Um, and so we're kind of ready to go. Um, but we do need your prayers, and Adrian will highlight that um, when he prays for us in a short while. Um, we're looking for a facilitator, so uh, Latin House is not a school, it's a learning centre, it's not registered as a school, because that kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. Um, but we do need, obviously, a, this won't be a teacher, it's called a facilitator, someone who will help the, the children learn online when they, get, when they get stuck. And so we're busy looking for a facilitator, it's quite a key position and so um, I will be Adrian and we'll be praying for that in a short while. Then um, let's have a quick look at some of the photos um, to see how the place looks. So this is the kind of before. Um, there's more horrible kind of before shots. It was need a lot of work. Here's one that shows you the, the after from, I think, from yesterday. Um, a lot of that is Jean's vision to make it look pretty. Um, we had a, a load of bath that was delivered. Uh, that was on Friday. Um, it was a really big pile, and there were just in particular two people to help clear that. So, if you go, is that the next shot with the, is that, that David bending down there? Good job, David. Now, the other person who was helping David was Barry Speed, and you know, his surname is Fitzy because he's so fast, <laughs> I couldn't get a photo. And uh, David's okay, next time he, David needs more help, but it's fine. So, well done, guys. And then um, we had lots of people helping us painting. Uh, making the, the place look a little bit better. 
um, just needs a good coat of paint and even the young ones were helping us and the dads needed a bit of a break <laughs> and of course we needed food um, but the place is looking so much better um, it's turning into a really pretty little garden area um, there's still more work to be done um, and still lots of prayer so we, we every now and then we'll be asked to help but please keep it up in prayer which Aileen will be doing for us in a minute so we want it to be a success in a place where God and his kingdom uh, is known and grown with the children and, and, and the future really Okay, thank you so much. So those are the notices for now. I'm just going to find my place again for my notes. Um, in the prayer book, uh, in the prayer book, we pray these little prayers called colics. They're tiny little prayers, and they change every week. And interesting, this week uh, is praying for us to uh, for God to stir us up and uh, uh, to do good works for him. Um, and then we'll uh, continue with the time of prayer. So let's pray the uh, collect for this week together. Stir up from me the wills of your faithful people, that they may produce plentifully the fruits of the good works, and receive from you a plentiful reward through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, Eddie will come up in a second uh, and pray for our missionaries, but we've got a video from our missionary as a, a, for an update. Uh, thanks, Eddie. Good evening, St. Mark's. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sandy told me that you wanted me to send you just a short video and just indicate some prayer requests. The first thing I want to say is this. Thank you that you are interested enough to ask us what you should pray for. So what I want to do tonight is I want to actually give you five, just five prayer requests. And the first one concerns my closest friend in Iraq, Edgar. And right now, Edgar is, as they say on the machines, his kidneys, his liver is packed up. He contracted the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and within the next day or two they had to decide whether to switch off the machines. He has two sons. He's only been married for 10 years. He has two sons, Benny and Joseph. They don't know that their father's in this situation. So please pray for Benny, Joseph and Milad, his wife. But please pray for the situation. And then secondly, I want to ask you to pray for our Read and Speak ministry. Now the Read and Speak ministry, at the moment we have between 8 to 10 Muslims who are on a weekly basis. I give them a portion to read from Luke's Gospel. And then in the week, they send me their reading. And I also ask them now, to close their Bibles after they've read and to retell me the story that they read. And then on Sunday nights, we have a Zoom meeting in which I study with them the concepts, the ideas, the thoughts. It's really like a mini Bible study. These are engineers, teachers. These are people who are the future fathers decision makers. And the Lord has given to us the privilege. So please pray for the Read and Speak ministry. And really, it's that many of them will be saved. I have the vision that one day when we leave, that many of them, having coming to know Jesus, will actually lead further Read and Speak groups all over Basra. And God is able so please pray for this ministry. And then also pray for Iraq. The corona a situation where really they are, it's over their heads in terms of their capability of meeting the problem. Their medical supplies, the medically trained people are totally unable, inadequate. They don't have the medical supplies. So please, I plead with you, pray for them. Because these people 
when they die, they go to a Christless eternity. And then the fourth thing, the reason why we are in Iraq is because of a people group called the Marsh Arabs. And the more we researched about the Marsh Arabs, we saw that they had no church. There were no Christians among them. And we really felt that the Lord saying to us, do something. We went out in what we believe is in obedience to the Great Commission to reach these people. And so over the years we have we've been living in their villages, but we have now concentrated through the sewing machine ministry of those who come to our home. Many of those ladies are marsh Arabs, where they are exposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then lastly, pray for Pat and myself. Pray for us that God will keep us fresh. God will, God will keep us spiritually on our toes. But I think it's another way of saying, Lord, keep us filled with your Holy Spirit. And so thank you again, St. Mark's, for praying. Thank you for your interest. Thank you that you are carrying us forward in your encouragement, in your prayers. The Lord bless you.
Bible readings now, and so uh, if you've got your Bibles, get them ready, and we'll have our Bible readings. New Testament reading is from Acts chapter 11, and we'll read the whole chapter. Acts chapter 11. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that the God that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with him. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This is the word of God. Well, I don't know what happened to our Old Testament reader, and that's why we need your help to, when we ask you for help to service and read and sing, that's why. (laughs) But let's um, have our Old Testament reading. And um, it's from uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. Uh, So turn there, Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, From verse 8, Isaiah 61. 
1 verse 8, and you'll notice what in the NIV I've got a heading that says the year of the Lord's favor, which is an important uh, heading. But reading from verse 8. Uh, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. He has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with with her jewels. For as the soil makes the young plant come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. And uh, we'll have a sermon just now, but let's uh, stand and recite the Apostles' Creed together, an affirmation of our faith, and that we believe God's word, and that we'll live it out. So let's stand and say the Apostles' Creed together. Uh, After this, the children can go out to their program, and then we will open the word to us. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of the heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered and of much sorrow, was crucified, He died and was buried. He descended to the grave. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand. Junction. 
Clapham Junction is one of the biggest uh, train stations in the south of London, and when we get to Clapham Junction, the doors of the train open, and suddenly it's like the whole city gets unlocked. Uh, the commuting masses. And suddenly everybody's cramped up, and it loses that familiarity, and it loses that comfort it, it had, and, and then you've just got to sit there with the rest of the crowds going into the city. Now, why am I telling you about my morning commute years ago? Well, because I want you to understand, my job is to help you to understand what's going on in Acts chapter 11, uh, in this part of the Bible. And what's going on here is very similar to my journey to work with regards to the kingdom of God. It's getting full for the first time. New people are coming in, and it's making the people who are already there quite uncomfortable. Okay, um, now the whole Bible really, I think this is why the, the train idea works well to describe what's going on here, because the whole Bible is a story, is a journey. It describes a journey. It describes a journey of humanity from a place of curse and sin and death to a place of blessing and righteousness and life. That's really what the whole Bible is about. This journey of humanity that God is making possible for humanity to go on from Genesis chapter 3 where we learn about the fall and we learn about the entering of sin and death into this world to Revelation chapter 21 where we get this amazing vision of the new creation. That is, and everything in between is how God is going to take people there. Okay, so you can understand the Bible story as a journey from, from curse to blessing. And God has provided a vehicle that people can get on to go there, to complete this journey. Because we could never get there by ourselves. Okay, we can never get to a restored world and restored lives and a place of righteousness and life, eternal life, by ourselves. Just as much as I could never walk to work in London. I had to catch the train. We have to get on the vehicle God has provided. What is that vehicle? Well, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that it's the covenant. All right, so you've heard that word before when we preach through Genesis. God provides a covenant. It's a way that people can, something that people can get on board with, and then He will use that to, to, to work on them and take them to the, where He wants them to be. That's pretty much, if you understand that framework, that the, the train on a journey is God providing a vehicle to take us from one place to another. If you understand that framework, you'll understand pretty much the whole scripture and how it fits together. But up until this point, Acts chapter 10 and 11, in the Bible story, it's only included Jews. That vehicle has only been Jews, and, and not a lot of them, and a lot of those Jews on the way, is Israelites, children of Abraham, jumped off the train on the journey by disobeying God's laws and joining the nations and worshipping idols. That's what we see in the Old Testament. But up until this point, there have been a few people on board this train. And here, this is why, Dylan said earlier, this is a foundational part of the Bible. The reason it's such a foundational uh, and critical part of the Bible, Acts chapter 10 and 11, is because for the first time in history, God is opening the doors of His covenant to the nations, to people who aren't Jews, to people from all nations and all tribes and all languages and all cultures. Now, as we heard in that reading from Isaiah earlier, that's not a new idea. God didn't just come up with that. In fact, right from the beginning of His plan to save you and me, thankfully for us, because most of us here are not Jews, if any of us are not descended from Abraham, God has planned to bring the nations into His saving plan and to, to provide them a way to get to His plan for this world, the new creation. And we see that in, in when he first speaks to Abraham in Genesis 12. He says, uh, through you the nations will be blessed. And then throughout the prophets we read about God's plan to bring people from every tribe and tongue and nation into his saving community. Into the vehicle that is going to carry us from this broken world to a new creation. And this is the first time that he's opened those doors to the nations. And this mixed group, now we read about in Acts 12, they form a church in Antioch. This is the first church with a mix of Jews and Gentiles. And what's really interesting when I was reading this, this chapter is that this is the first time in the Bible that we come across the word Christian. And that is no mistake. 
in there in verse 26, if you have a look, Acts chapter 11, 26, at the end, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now that the doors have opened, the Gentiles have come on board, God's plans for the nations are starting to see fulfillment. Now we see this new word in the Bible, Christian. And so understanding this point of the Bible story, understanding where we are in the Bible and what this means and what is happening in this chapter, which we're going to go to in a bit more detail now, helps us to understand what Christians really are. And what I want to do this morning is just from this story of what happens, uh, Peter has this discussion with, the, with the, the Jewish Christians and then we learn about the planting of the church in Antioch and um, what they do. That's what chapter 11 is about. I just want us to see two marks of what Christians are, two marks that characterize Christians from this chapter, seeing that this is the first time we come across that word. Okay, that's where we're going. The first mark of Christians is that there are people who are different from one another. <laughs> by, by definition, there are people who are different from one another. So let's look at how the story develops. Peter comes um, to... Uh, well, we see there, he went, he went up to Jerusalem. It's interesting, he's at the north, but they, they say he went up to Jerusalem. Now, that's not talking about north and south, it's actually talking about the elevation of the country. Jerusalem was built on elevation. That's why it says he went up to Jerusalem, and he, he went and reported what happened to these um, Jewish Christians. But look what they say in verse 3. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. They were shocked that Peter was was let alone socializing with Gentiles, he was eating with them. Now, the first thing we need to understand is what a shocking thing that was for a Jew. Because, and it wasn't because Jewish, Jews were racists, by the way. That's not why they didn't like the Gentiles. It was because of their laws in the Old Testament that were designed deliberately to keep them separate from Gentiles. And there was a reason for that. But that's what the laws in the Old Testament and the Jewish laws that then for hundreds of years they built upon those laws were all for the purpose of keeping the Jews separate from the Gentiles. Basically, you can understand it like a form of spiritual social distancing. And we all know what, what that's like. Social distancing, making sure we keep separate from people so we don't get infected by a virus that they might have. Well, that's exactly what the Jewish laws were about. They were designed... Because the Jews didn't want to get infected with the sin and the wickedness of the nations that didn't have God's law and hadn't God, had God's law revealed and God's purposes revealed to them. They were just caught up in sin and they were, they were really bad. Like, uh, you know, if you look back in history and you look at what some of these ancient pagan cultures got up to, sacrificing their children and it was disgusting. In the past 2,000 years, we've had the privilege of living in a culture, even though it's it's secular, it's, it's founded on biblical principles. But those pagan cultures never had that. Only the Jews had that. And that's why they were adamant to make sure they didn't get infected by the nations. Their eating, their, their dietary laws made sure that they couldn't eat with the Gentiles. Because when you eat with someone, you socialize and you share ideas and stuff. No, the Jews must stay away. So they had special dietary laws. They had special clothing laws. They, were, they had circumcision laws just to make sure... Um, that they couldn't mix families either. Deliberate ways of keeping the Jews apart from the Gentiles. Well, one of the ways you can understand the laws in the Old Testament was that it, if you use this train idea, is that it's not so much the way that the Jews got on the train, it's the way they stayed on the train. It wasn't the ticket to get on the train and, and to be part of God's people. It was the doors that stopped them from jumping off. Okay, that's essentially a way of understanding what the Old Testament laws were about. And there was another reason that we read in Galatians that God gave the law and kept the Jews separate from the Gentiles. And that is because he had a plan to send his Messiah to the world through the Jews. And therefore, he wanted there still to be a people of God, a covenant people when the Messiah came. And so he gave those laws to make sure that they didn't get absorbed into the nations. But, now, this is why this part of the Bible is so critical. Now that the Messiah has come, that law is no longer needed. Those laws to keep God's people separate from the nations were no longer needed. Why? Well, look uh, down at verse 15 of 
chapter 11. Look what's happening at this part in history. Uh, Peter is reporting about his conversation with the Gentiles, and he says, and this basically is him reporting what happened in chapter 10 with Cornelius the centurion. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them, just as on us at the beginning. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he also gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? Okay. So he's saying, the reason that the law now is no longer applicable is because Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. And that is a, a vital thing. It was what the prophet said would happen, that God would pour his Spirit out on all nations. But now God, uh, Jesus is pouring out the Spirit on the Gentiles. That he's giving them tickets to the train that they never had before. Uh, and he's allowing them to step on board. And the Jewish Christians seeing this, they understood, therefore, that if Jesus, the Messiah and Lord, who has been ascended and is sitting on the throne, has seen fit to justify the Gentiles, who are they to argue? And that, so that was their attitude. You can see how they ended up in verse 18. When they heard this, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, So then God has given repentance resulting in life even to the Gentiles. Okay, so now the social distancing of the law <coughs> is not only unnecessary, but it's actually something that will prevent the Gentiles getting on board if the Jews carried on following it. Because if God's opened the doors to the train, to the vehicle that's going to take people to the new creation, and the, the Jews are inside and the Gentiles are coming on board, but the Jews think they've still got to keep separate to the Gentiles, what are they going to do? They're going to stop them from coming. They're going to get to the doors and barrier them up and bar, bar the way. In fact, some of the early Jewish Christians try to do that. And Paul writes... Uh, to them, the, the Galatian Christians. Paul writes in Galatians, you can check that yourself. And he says, you guys, stop it. The, you foolish Galatians. He's very, very cross with them. And he says, stop trying to keep the Gentiles from coming on board. Stop trying to conform them to Jewishness. Because the law of God is no longer necessary. And it's actually counterproductive. So now, what we see here is, instead of trying to stop people getting on the train, the Jews had to welcome them. And they did, because they, they understood what was going on. Uh, that verse 16. Uh, I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was talking to the Israelites, his Israelite disciples. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But then Peter says, these Cornelius and his household were baptized with the Holy Spirit, so now they are part of us. And so that's what they realized. God, it's not like God is, is doing something different with the Gentiles. He's bringing the Gentiles into the family of Abraham. And that's what he meant there. When he said, they, they have become part of us. They, they have the same ticket as us. Faith in Jesus Christ. And that, the faith in the Messiah is what justifies both Jew and Gentile. But this was difficult for the Jews to, to get, and it took them a long time to understand that God had opened the doors to the world in this Antioch church. But that is a foundational uh, aspect of the church, is that it necessarily is made up of people who are different from one another. Okay, And I wanted you to see that, I wanted you to see why it's happening here, because it obviously has a lot of effects for how we do church. And how we see other people as Christians and other Christians, people in the covenant. But we'll get to that in a bit. But what I wanted you to see so far is that God's kingdom is necessarily made up of people who are different from one another. But they are also profoundly united together. So despite their differences, we go on to read in this chapter something amazing. Something uh, that you wouldn't have expected. Look at the end of the chapter from verse uh, 27. Some prophets came from Jerusalem. One of them named Agabus stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a famine throughout the Roman world. This did take place. So Luke's actually saying here, because he's writing after these facts, uh, after the famine took place, but they predicted it would before it took place. And Luke's saying it actually did happen during the reign of Claudius. So they were absolutely right. It was a true prophecy. But look what happened. Look what these Gentile 
Previously, pagan believers did. Each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers and sisters who lived in Judea. And they did this, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. This is amazing. The nation of Israel was, in Solomon's day, the one that the, that, that the Gentiles relied upon to provide for them. That's what was happening. They were an economic powerhouse in Solomon's day. And here we see the opposite happening. The Jewish church is about to undergo a famine sent by God to make them rely on the Gentiles to support them. Remember when we did uh, 2 Corinthians? We see a similar situation where Paul in 2 Corinthians 9 and 10 is telling the Gentile Corinthians that the Jewish Christians need their help and to send money. And, and God, God created a need amongst the Jews to connect these people together to solidify this previously uh, this, this thing that this barrier this connection where there was previously just this barrier uh, God is creating now that's quite profound isn't it God is creating a need to bring Christians together think about that you know often we might go God why, why have you put me in this situation why am I in need well look what he does he created and he put the Jews, the, the Christians in Jerusalem, in a dire need in order to have them rely on the broader church as a way God is unifying the church. God has a much bigger plan at play here. And so when uh, you are going through difficulties, remember this might be a way that God is drawing you to rely on other Christians. It might be a way that he is solidifying the church. It's the way he keeps the church together. Anyway, that's just an aside. I, I wanted you just to see how, despite their differences, they were profoundly unified and partnered together. And this leads us to the second distinguishing mark of Christians from this passage. And that is that Christians are people who obviously belong to Jesus. And it's, it's obvious. Look at verse 26 again. And this is quite cool. Uh, to, at the end, the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. They were called Christians. That word Christian is a very interesting one. Uh, it's, it's the, word, the English word Christian is just the transliteration of that Greek word, which is Christianos. Now that ending, Ianos, is most often used of something that is owned by the name it's attached to. So if some, someone owns something and you put Ianos in the end of their, their name, that's the thing that they own. So, for example, uh, Alex's Lego and books in his room would be called the Alexianos. And he would make sure that Amy knows that these are the Alexianos. These belong to me. And so, in the same way, the Christianos are those who belong to Jesus. The Christianos are the property of Jesus. And here's the thing. They didn't call themselves that. They knew that. They knew that they belonged to Jesus, their Lord. It was the non-Christians who called them the Christianos. There was something so obvious that they, these people belonged to the Lord that they coined that term for this group of disciples. And everywhere else we read the, this word, the Christianos, in the New Testament, it's used as a derogatory term from non-Christians. Those are the possessions of Christ that crucified Harper to Harper Fett. So that, that term, the, the belongings of Christ, was used to insult them. But they didn't mind. Of course, they, they, saw, they took it on as a badge of honor. They were proud of it. Luke was proud of it. When he wrote here, they were called the Christianos. They all, Jew and Gentile, were happy to belong to Christ because they knew who he really is. In fact, it was a relief given what they knew was going to happen when he comes back in judgment. Because no matter how derogatory that term is used for you or for any Christian, when Jesus comes back, everyone will want to be a Christianos. But it will be too late for me. And so never be ashamed of it. Never be ashamed of, of being called a belonging of Christ. Because... Yeah, there's no greater thing to be. But what I want you to 
see here is that it was something about them that made it obvious to the world around them that they belonged to Jesus. And this was important because before this point in the Bible story, you could tell who the people of God were. They were the Jews. They were the people who wore the funny clothes and were circumcised and did the funny laws and ate the funny food. But now you couldn't. Now, with the law being abolished because of what Jesus did on the cross, how do you tell who the people of God were? Well, they couldn't be told apart by the law of Moses, but that wasn't needed because everybody knew who they were. They were the ones who couldn't stop talking about Jesus and couldn't stop living for Jesus. And an immediate example? Well, we see their generosity. It was because of how they used their money. It was because of their focus in their life of what was important that was obvious to the world around them that they belonged to Jesus. Because they said they, they gave of whoever had surplus, they gave according to their ability, determined to send relief to the brothers. They were working for Christ. Their money was Christ. The most obvious way to see whether someone really belongs to Jesus is to see if their money belongs to Jesus. You know, a lot of people call themselves Christians, but they, their, their bank account doesn't. And what we see here, these early disciples, they put their money where their mouth was. And that's how people can see they belong to Jesus, because their money obviously belongs to Jesus. Okay, so that's in a very summarized form, Acts chapter 11. And I hope you can see why it's such an important part of the Bible story, and why we can see what the distinguishing marks of Christians are. The distinguishing marks of Christians are a diverse group of people who are nonetheless united by their shared allegiance to Christ as their owner, which is obvious to outsiders. That is what Christians are. So, let us now evaluate ourselves at St. Mark's by that measure. Let's start with the second one. Is it obvious to people that we belong to Jesus Christ? Is it obvious to people outside when they look at our lives? If you are a Christianist, what is it about you that makes it obvious to outsiders that you belong to Christ enough that they'll mock you for it? Can people see that your life belongs to Jesus? People at work, people in your life around you, in how you speak, in how you act, in how you spend your time and your money. Hey, are you coming to the clubhouse this Saturday? We're going to have a blast. Oh, sorry, I'm actually helping out at my church. We've got a work party on. What? The church? What a waste of time. These Christians. They always spend their time at church with these, in their little Christian group. Or your investment advisor says, uh, I've looked at your money and I think you should invest your surplus funds in this equity portfolio that I'm going to propose. Well, I'll stop you there. I'm actually going to invest that surplus in some Christian work we're starting at my church. What? That's a bit of a waste of money. You won't get any return on that. Well, you just wait and see. <laughs> what conversations do you have that make it obvious to people that you belong to Christ? And if it's not obvious... Then the question is, how do we make sure that it becomes obvious in our lives? How do we make sure people know we belong to Jesus, that we are truly Christianos, that they will even mock us for it? Well, let's look at what happened in this church and what Barnabas did and what he said. It's quite important to help us to know how we can make sure we belong to Christ and that's obvious to people. Um, pick it up from verse 23. When he arrived, this is Barnabas, he was sent by the Christians in Jerusalem to go check out this apparently new church plant of Gentiles. And so he went on his mission to check them out. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. Your translation might read something slightly different. But... What he did there is he told them they need to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. Literally, that means remain faithful to the Lord in the direction of your hearts. That's, that's, that was his message. He went and did a bit of a guest preaching series at their church. And this was the summary of his message to them. Remain faithful to the Lord in the direction of your hearts. 
Now, our hearts are what give us direction. In the Bible, our hearts are more than just the muscle that pumps blood through our body. They are the, uh, our hearts are the, uh, the seat of our emotions, our desires, and the things that drive us towards certain directions in our lives. And we all have drives towards certain directions in our lives, what we want to get out of life, what we're being driven towards. Well, for a Christianos, each day we wake up, our job is to ensure that the direction of our heart lines up with what our Lord is doing in this world. That is what a Christianos is, that we, we are people who deliberately make sure that every day we line up the direction of our hearts with Jesus and what, is he, what he is doing in this world. What is he doing in this world? Well, you find out in the Bible. And so that's why we come to church and sit under, under sermons, because this helps us to know what we must line up our hearts to, to make sure we are heading in the same direction as Jesus, and when we are, people will notice, and we will be united, like these early Christians were. And we will start to get along despite our differences. When we are all lined up in the same direction. Put a whole bunch of people who have nothing in common, and they're all heading in different directions and want different things. I've seen churches like that. It's a disaster. But when we line up our hearts and what we want with what Jesus is doing, that's when that's when we are united in a way that you can no, see nowhere else in this world. And that's the second thing. So the first point is the second point application is us being united as Christians. That's a mark of a Christian, getting along despite our differences. Because you see, just as the Jews had boundary markers before this moment, these markers of lifestyle to keep them separate from the non-Jews, so do we. Not as Jews, but we put boundary markers in our lives. Certain ways of going about life, certain lifestyles, maybe um, certain cultures. And we, we, make, we, we construct boundary markers, especially in, a, in such a polarized world we live in today where uh, we only get on with those we agree with. Have you noticed that? It's in, the last, in this generation. In, in, in the polarized world we live in, especially through social media, which is designed, by the way, to get you only to be exposed to people who you agree with. Yeah. It polarizes us. And what do we do? We set up our own boundary markers. We're not only going to relate with and get on with people that totally 100% agree with us. And so you see how we put our own boundary markers up, like the Jews have? Our own things that keep us separate from people. And that's why we need this morning to get what the Jewish Christians needed to get. That Jesus welcomes people who are different to us into his people and so what right do you have to hold anything against them and not welcome them into your life if Jesus forgives and welcomes them and that is why Christians we are called to get along we are called you, you see it throughout the New Testament to work on being united and being at peace with each other it's why Christians cannot be a people who hold things against each other and bicker about each other behind backs. That is, that is, we are above that. Paul, in his writings, is vehemently against the wickedness of slander and gossip. Because it puts barriers up that Jesus died to take down. Jesus died to take down, down the dividing walls between us. What right do we have to put up dividing walls by talking about each other behind our backs? It's evil. It's wicked. It's, it totally undermines what Jesus did for us. Because despite our differences, we are one people because we are owned by the same Lord. And the more we line up our lives with Him, not only will it become obvious to outsiders who we belong to, but the more we will be lined up with each other, and as the early church was, the more we will be of one heart and mind, giving ourselves to God's mission together, and it's when we do that that we will be the church God wants us to be. Let's pray that that will be the case. Lord, we thank you for your amazing plan of salvation to create a way to take us from the curse of sin and death 
and to bring us to life. We thank you, Lord, that you have opened the doors through Jesus Christ and what he did for us, that anybody may come in. And we pray, Lord, that we would therefore learn to overcome the differences between us, to be at peace with each other, to be in open, honest relationships with each other, and to line up our lives with Jesus Christ, so that every day we would live lives that are obviously owned by Jesus, and that the world around us would see. And use this church, Lord, as we are united in a common goal together. Use this church to to be a, an amazing witness to our surrounding uh, people who are still outside of your saving plans. And, and Lord, use us to bring them in, to bring them through the doors, to proclaim Christ, to bring them into your covenant, that they might be saved. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great, thank you, Nick. And isn't it great to, this is why we come to church, because I'm going to church, gosh, I in my life, and you still learn something new. Now I learn something new about the word Christian. <laughs> you know, now you know it means you belong to a Lord, Jesus, and uh, it's amazing. Um, and so helpful, um, and so important uh, that we realize who we are, that we're unified under Christ, and that that must play out in our lives. Let's take that on board. Well, let's end our time together singing again, because we can now. And uh, a, a, a lovely old hymn, To God Be the Glory, To God Be the Glory. Um, great things He has done because He's given us His Son. So let's stand and sing together.
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.